Yeah. Uh, yesterday we started discussing the design of a walking robot for a specific purpose. Uh, this is one of the case studies that we will be seeing in the course. The purpose of this particular machine is to move in a nuclear power plant where there is radioactivity and do some very simple operations like monitoring and maintenance. The requirements that are posed for this machine were uh, discussed in the last class and we came down to decisions like the number of legs and the arrangements of the legs. How to now size and position the workspaces of the feet that was the issue we were discussing in the last class. So, to give you the background to that the machine has a body with six legs arranged axis symmetrically around a vertical axis then the natural shape of the workspace of a foot would be a solid sector like this sector of a cylinder like this. But remember that we are placing the we may have to place the actuator which rotates the whole leg away from the center of the body and so we may not be able to access the innermost regions of this sector the, that may have to be hollow. So, if we look at the workspace it would look something like this an annular cylinder a hollow cylinder with inner radius r i and outer radius r o r outer and height h. Now, how do you position this on the body once you position one all others are arranged symmetrically similarly. Now, how do you decide this? Now, in order to decide this we need to consider some of the specifications which were drawn up at the beginning one of which was the step it should be able to climb at least 0 0.5 meters it should be able to climb. Another was that the stroke of the foot should be at least 5 0 0.5 meters. This is in order to be able to step across some obstacle on the ground smaller obstacles on the ground. Now, based on this how do we determine the size of the workspace we will determine it in such a way that the total size of the leg eventually should be small right. Now, in order to determine this you need to consider the way in which the machine would be walking. First of all let us consider how it would climb a step there are different ways we can make it climb a step. So, if we look at a step we can imagine that the body would be something like this one or a set of legs up there like this another set of legs down here like this this is quite possible right you tilt the body and you reach the step and then climb up while doing that of course, you have to ensure that it is stable fine. But a different way of climbing is the following which is actually even simpler right. So, in this the way it is climbing the height of the body above some datum remains fixed in spite of climbing onto a step right that does not change at all. You just place the feet at the appropriate height as you climb. So, the manner in which it climbs would be almost similar to the way it walks on level ground only remember that while it comes here when it lifts the leg in order to place here you have to ensure that the leg or the body does not hit the step that has to be taken care of. But we can regard this as a broad approach for climbing. So, the difference between this way of climbing and this way of climbing is that 
here the body tilts here the body does not tilt right. In order to be able to climb like this this point as well as this point has to be part of the workspace. So, the minimum height of the workspace that you need here is the height of the step itself that you should have at least that. So, we took this as 0 0.55 meter. So, in order to have some leeway. So, height of the workspace is decided like this fine. Now, if you look at the body in relation to this workspace this particular swivel actuator the axis would be somewhere here and the body would extend beyond like this right. The body would be something like this. So, the swivel actuator will rotate the leg in order to access this workspace. So, for the moment let us not consider it like that let us consider that this particular simple picture and see how we need to now size this workspace these two dimensions r outer and r inner such that a stroke of 0 0.5 meters can be accommodated within the workspace right. In order to understand that we have to see how the machine would walk on level ground. For a six leg machine there are many types of gates which are possible. I will just show two very simple gates for which this machine was designed. The idea is that once it is able to walk with a particular gate it should be able to walk at least with some stroke with the other gates. So, what we will try to ensure is that it should be able to work with one or two gates important gates with a 0 0.5 meter stroke. Okay. So, two typical gates are like this if you think of the body see the alternate legs there is a leg here there is a leg here and there is a leg here which are currently lifted. These three feet are on the ground right and the body is getting propelled forward on these legs. So, this is what is called the tripod gate the feet forms a triangle on the ground right. If you take the three feet on the ground the convex hull of that that is a minimal convex set which includes those three points is a triangle fine. Now, this minimal convex uh, set the convex hull has an important role to play in stability of the system. Now, if you look at the center mass of the system which is somewhere here this system the necessary and sufficient condition for this to be stable on level ground is that the projection of the center mass downwards falls within this particular triangle called the support pattern. Another way we can calculate this is try to calculate the reaction forces on the three feet coming from the ground. If any of them is negative it means that the system is going to topple. For example, if this this is negative and these two are positive it means that the it is going to topple in this direction. This can only happen if this particular center mass is on this side. So, if center mass is inside the triangle, it will not topple. So, stability has been quantified using this concept the distance of the center mass at any point from the triangle edge, edge of the triangle, or the support pattern is called the stability margin. So, if your support pattern, let us say there are four legs or five legs on the ground, let us say five legs are on the ground the convex hull of these phi legs is this quadrilateral. The central mass let us assume is here 
the shortest distance from the central mass to the edge of the convex hull is regarded as what is called the kinematic stability margin. If it is moving in a particular direction the stability margin in that direction there are two one in this direction one in the opposite are called longitudinal stability margins. So, when the machine walks we have to ensure that at every point of time there is enough stability margin. Okay. So, the two simple gauges that are used are the following these three legs are placed on the ground at a time the body gets propelled on the, those legs the other three legs are being brought forward and then they are placed on the ground and this is going to be lifted. So, when this gets lifted so let me draw that. So, what happens is that on this leg the body gets propelled forward. So, center mass keeps moving forward the body also moves forward it may come to this point right the center mass may come to that point and at that point what we need to do is we have to place the other tripod. So, this is the new position of the center mass the way we place the tripod we have to ensure that this center mass is within this tripod. Now, you can lift this tripod right. Now, on this tripod the center mass keeps moving forward further and once when it comes near the edge of that tripod you place the other tripod. This is the forward progression right 3 feet placed at a time on the ground and the body propelled forward on those 3 feet. This is called a very simple tripod gate and this is probably the simplest gate you can think of and remember 3 feet are going to be moved as if they are 1 foot it is almost like planting a large foot on the ground. Okay. Now, this is one of the uh, gates that we considered the other gate we considered is called the crab gate that is like this it is different only in the arrangement of the legs. So, we are moving in this direction so there is a leg here and that may be placed on the ground let us say here. And the four other legs are these then this is on the ground at this point of time and this is also on the ground at this point of time. So, the triangle formed is this what is the advantage the advantage is the following this leg is moved forward like this and these two actually backward like this this is aligned in this direction these two are aligned in this direction. Similarly, the other three are also aligned in the direction in which the machine moves at this point of time it is lifted in the air and is being brought forward the the black triangle or the black legs are on the ground right. The orientation of the triangle is different in these two cases also you can immediately see that the way I have drawn the size of the machine the stability margin is likely to be smaller here fine. So, this is the other tripod gate this also is a tripod gate fine only the direction in which it is moving is along the along the direction of a of a leg and three legs are directed in one direction three legs in the opposite direction this is called crab gate. this is roughly the way crabs walk both these are tripod gates. Okay. So, in both for both these gates I have to ensure two things sufficient stability margin and sufficient stroke for the foot and what is the stroke to understand what the stroke is imagine when you walk how the foot moves with respect to you. it has to be a close curve what is the shape of that curve so 
So when you walk, if you look at how the foot is placed, if you take let's say the angle, the way that moves with respect to the person is, uh, with respect to the ground is, this is on the ground now and when the body moves forward, it remains on the ground. At the time it gets lifted, it gets shifted from here to a new position, same distance as this and then in the next side it gets shifted to this and then planted. While it is here, the body is moving forward, remember. This is how the foot moves with respect to the ground when a person walks. But what is important is, how does the foot move with respect to the person himself? If you look at that, imagine that the body is stationary and the foot is moving. The foot moves along a curve like this the opposite direction of course. If the body is moving forward, the foot moves in this direction with respect to the body. The stance phase that is the phase of the foot when it is on the ground starts at this point when it touches the ground and it gets lifted at this particular point, right. So this roughly D shaped, shaped curve is how the foot moves with respect to the body of the machine like this also. So if we make the foot move like this in an appropriate coordinated fashion, we are able to propel the body forward. Now the stroke of the foot is this. Right? Now we need to accommodate this entire region within the workspace, right? It cannot go outside the workspace of the foot. So if we have a stroke of 0.5 meters with some extra allowance allowed for this accelerating the foot backwards so that when it touches the ground, there is no slip between the foot and the ground and for proper lifting without slippage, this extra distance is required. So if you estimate some small value for that, we can now design the workspace in such a way that a stroke of 0.5 meters is accommodated within and sufficient stability margin is available. So this is a problem which has to be solved in order to size the workspace, right. So if you look at this gate, we can do the sizing as follows. So this is the center of the uh, machine. Let us assume when the foot is on the ground, it moves along a straight line like this, the machine is moving in this direction. So that is one foot, this is another foot and this is the third foot, fine. If you decide when to place the foot, where to place the foot with respect to the a reference frame on the body, that is during the stand space, then it has moved backwards by 0 0.5 meters but it has to accommodate a slight distance in front and behind. All this has to be within the workspace. Similarly here also and similarly here also. So then what we could do is we can position this 0 0.5 meter workspace, I mean stroke or the additional the extended one in such a way that it is within a sector the way we want, right. It has to be within, so if you look at this particular type of gate. If you look at this gate, there is one foot here, one foot here, I mean one leg pivoted here, one leg pivoted here, one here, one here and two here. So if I number the leg, say starting from one, this is two, this is three, four, five and six. If I do that, the legs I am talking about here are the alternate ones 1, 3 and 5, and then now the sector of my uh, workspace will be a 60 degree triangle, 60 degree cone I draw from here. This should include this particular thing, right. Similarly and here too. So these regions are essentially the, the 
the workspaces. So what I can do is I can now try to find out the smallest size of this three says that of course they have to have exactly the same size says that all this is accommodated within and in addition to that I have to ensure the following suppose at any point of time the foot is at a particular position let us consider this particular position the foot is here correspondingly the foot here is that distance same distance from its end the foot here is the same distance from this end. Now if you draw a triangle the you would have assumed some stability margin a certain length for the stability margin if you draw a circle with the radius equal to that stability margin that should be within this triangle at every point when the foot is on the ground this has to be ensured. So once we demand this and then minimize the total size of the workspace we get a solution for accommodating 0.5 meter stroke within this with the smallest size for the workspace. This is a problem which can be formulated as an optimization problem and solved fine this is how we get the smallest workspace is the procedure clear you could probably formulate it in different ways and solve it actually in formulating it uh, some symmetries which are obvious here help us formulate it in a more economical fashion. Now this is one problem the other problem to be formulated is the same thing when it is walking with the other gate where here the inner and outer radius of the workspace can be calculated whereas in order to calculate the swell uh, the axis of the rotation of the leg we need to find out the radius of the body itself. So, if you look at the gate you will remember that this gate is something like this this particular stroke has to be accommodated here. So, some stroke has to be accommodated here. So, at any any point if the foot is here let us say then we can draw this triangle which is the convex hull of the workspace a convex hull of the foot pattern and then we need to ensure that here remember the leg is aligned in this direction aligned in this direction and this direction. So, we already know the inner and outer from here fine for example the solution to this turns out that the total work the outer radius of the workspace RO turned out to be of the value was 0 0.25 plus 0 0.124 plus 0 0.511 this was the solution for the problem that we solved fine there were some modifications made later. So, this was the outer radius this turned out to be the outer radius okay. this is the distance at which the radius of the axis was initially located that actually all comes from this solution also. So, let me complete this solution. So, now I have to figure out for a sufficient stability margin here where should I locate what should be the radius of the so these axis uh, from the, the distance from the center as well as where should I locate this that has already been decided actually from the earlier solution. So, basically we are deciding here this particular radius is that uh, sufficient uh, stability margin is available for this gate. So, it turned out that this particular figure 0 0.25 was sufficient if we are prepared to bring down the stability margin to some extent here. So, here you used a stability margin of 0 0.125 this is what I remember as here I think we needed to come down to stability margin of 0 0.1 that is what I remember. Now, in addition to this in deciding this workspaces and stability and uh, uh, workspaces in this fashion we also considered collision between feet collision between legs. Now, the leg has not been designed at this stage, but a rough idea of the uh, arrangement of the leg was known the cross sections were in de, uh, decided, but we had to estimate that and apply it here in order to size the workspace. So, we assumed a width of the leg section 
of 0.1 meter 10 centimeters when we calculated all this. This is to check collision. So, all this has to be done without collision. So, this is how the workspace was determined and it turned out to be the following. So, if I draw that let the swivel axis of the leg be this uh, sorry this is let this be the body and this be the swivel axis then the workspace was it turned out that an ideal size for the workspace was this this height was 0 0.55 the height of the workspace which we saw this particular distance was uh, 0 0.511 that 1 millimeter has no consequence. This distance in order to accommodate some hardware below turned out to be 0 0.3 meters fine and this particular distance from the swivel axis where the workspace starts that is inner radius is 0 0.124. All these were calculated based on the considerations which I told you about. The detailed formulation I am not coming to is basically a geometry problem and this is the body and the center of the swivel axis from the center of the body is 0 0.25. This was the arrangement of the workspaces. And the kind of leg which will actually uh, enable the foot to reach within this workspace is something like this. The dimension of that I will come to, but a simple form of the leg is something like that. Now, what kind of a leg will allow us to reach this kind of a workspace? The mechanism of the leg has to be designed. How do we proceed with that design? So, it needs to access a workspace like this. There is one uh, mechanism for the leg which is very very popular in walking machines. There are a couple of reasons why it is popular. It is based on the pantograph. So, I will draw the pantograph and explain why it is popular. So, if you look at the earlier figure, if you look at the earlier earlier figure, I have drawn the leg as just a a tooling mechanism. Right? This is the leg is pivoted to this particular body which can rotate about this axis. Okay? So, this particular body I have drawn here, this is what it is and the part of the leg I drew there is just this part. Okay? It is called this point A, B, C, D and E and this is the foot F. Fine. Now, why this is a pantograph? Uh, its special property is that if I now move this along some curve, this actually moves along a scale version of that curve. Maybe there is a reflection also but essentially a scaled and scaled and reflected version of that curve. Okay? The scaling factor is equal to the ratio of these two distances, which is uh, the same as the ratio of some of the other distances in the mechanism. Now, how do I move this particular point 
so what i need to do is i need to move this along a d shape curve right i need to move this along a d shape curve this is the stance portion correct this is what i need to do now this can be done in different ways you can attach a 2 degree of freedom mechanism to this this being the coupler point of that 2 degree of freedom mechanism and then this point can be moved in any fashion that you want there is one way you can do this right so this has been done in different ways one way it is done is for example uh, make this particular move along a vertical curve vertical straight line make this point move along a horizontal straight line so these two motions together will enable you to obtain any motion that you want here okay now the reason why pantograph is useful is the following if you can ensure that one advantage is that the vertical motion and the horizontal motions can be decoupled can be handled by two separate actuators so when the vertical actuator vertical motion is needed you need to move only one actuator when the horizontal motion is needed you need to move only one actuator this is an advantage this decouples this simplifies the control of the system but the other advantage is related to energy it turns out that uh, if we are moving the actuator which supports the weight of the mechanism weight of the machine while it is moving forward without changing shifting its center of gravity the power the work that needs to be done in order to actually support that weight that is wasted that really is not adding to the change in energy of the machine so it turns out that a pantograph mechanism helps you there are other mechanisms which also help you that which help you minimize the dissipation due to this kind of energy loss it is a concept which i don't want to go into detail but this is another reason why pantograph mechanism is, mechanism is found to be useful now let me show the arrangement which is used in our machine in order to move this to this point along a curve like this slightly different from what i described what we did was we had a linear actuator here we added a link to this or uh, a part to this link and at the end of this we had another linear actuator these linear actuators were mounted on the body which are which is to be swive rotated about a vertical axis oh. i should have put it on this so pardon me the arrangement was this this is the frame of the leg that will be rotated about an axis like this this part of the mechanism with the foot is basically a planar mechanism which works on this mounted on this frame okay it is a 2 degree of freedom mechanism moved by two linear actuators changing the length from here to here and from here to here is the way we make the mechanism move now it turns out that if i lock this actuator and move only this actuator this moves in a roughly vertical fashion it how does that happen i'll explain when i lock this what happens is that this link gets locked so the whole thing gets converted to a one degree of freedom mechanism now with this link locked and this particular pivot also locked in position now when i move this actuator this point is moving along an arc with this as center an arc like this this being a pantograph mechanism you will see exactly the same arc here in this fashion so that is a rough vertical motion what about the horizontal motion if i lock this actuator and move this i told you that this is a one degree of freedom mechanism because i have locked this this length remains fixed and this is pivoted about this so obviously this point is going to move 
along an arc with this as center and that will be roughly horizontal and you will see that horizontal arc being obtained there is a reflection the way the mechanism is there is a reflection for getting the curve here from the curve here it gets reflected about this. So this is essentially how you generate roughly vertical motion and roughly horizontal motion by these two actuators. This is not perfect decoupling but it is decoupling to a great extent fine. So this is how the mechanism works and it is designed in such a way that these link lengths are chosen in such a way that the total length is small as small as possible and it is able to access the region which I told you that 550 millimeter by 511 millimeter rectangular region. Uh, in addition we ensured that this particular angle which is equivalent to transmission angle in this case is not too small or too large. So this again is posed as an optimization problem and we get the link lens. In order to do this we also assume that the ratio of these two curves we took a ratio of 5 is to 1 or 1 is to 5. This was a roughly ad hoc decision which was checked later with some other values fine. This is the design of the leg okay the whole thing is put on the body. There are 6 legs like that all around and while designing this you have to ensure the way you put the links actually finally this is only a kinematic design finally you will have to embody that you will have to size the cross sections and you have to decide the bearings the type of bearings. So you need to place various links with respect to each other in this in this direction. So all that is done considering various interferences that can happen while the leg moves fine and the cross section is determined based on the various forces that are going to come on the links. The forces are changing because you have forces at different points in the workspace okay. So one of the considerations for that is the vertical force that is going to see we had an estimate of the maximum vertical force it is going to see and that has to come from an estimate of the weight of the body right weight of the total machine. So we cannot proceed further without estimating the weight of the total machine. Now how do you estimate the weight of the total machine? We arrive at some starting value so rough estimate let us say 200 kilogram force based on that we based on the triangle tripod and all that we estimated a maximum of 130 kilogram force to act vertically on a foot and a maximum of 20 kilogram force to act horizontally this 20 kilogram force comes from the ramp it has to climb fine. So based on all that we arrive at the forces on the various links on the feet from which we can estimate the cross sections of the leg. After you get the cross sections you have to move this along these various D shaped curves with certain velocities we had estimated a certain velocity for moving forward it was 0 0.2 meters per second. So you need to have some acceleration deceleration because this being lifted and brought down as well as brought forward and back. So based on all that we can estimate the motor sizes motors can be selected based on that. Once you select the motors you start getting an idea of what is the real weight of the whole thing not only the motor but actually the gear boxes also. Then we need to check whether our 200 kilogram force estimate was sufficiently accurate. Our initial estimate was that it is all right we can proceed further but it finally when it was finally fabricated it turned out that some of our initial design were faulty because the strength was not sufficient it finally turned out to be closer to 270 kilogram force. Luckily the models that we had selected that was sufficient and the leg design was with some leeway. So it can actually support 200 kilogram force not 130 kilogram force. So it was able to accommodate this increase in weight 
only the motors are not able to give us the 0.2 meters per second that we initially wanted. So, some compromise had to be made. Right? What I am trying to say is that a design like this cannot actually take place in a very sequential linear fashion. It is an activity which requires quite a bit of iterations. You have to use certain inputs which at, uh, which at the beginning you can only estimate, you do not know exactly. You have to make those estimates, proceed with the design and once you proceed with the details of the design, you start getting more accurate values of those inputs, those estimates. Then you have to iterate to see whether all aspects of the design which we designed it for are satisfied with the new values. Fine. So, this is with regard to the and this is some of the important aspects of the design of a walking machine like this. And if you look at this, you will see that this is almost a 3 degree of freedom manipulator. If we put a wrist at the end of it, you have a regular manipulator, right. And what we were proposing was at the end of it, add a gripper. So, add a couple of more links with a gripper, so that it will be able to do some simple maintenance operations. Okay. So, now I do not want to describe uh, the design aspects any further, because there are a lot of details uh, which I can get into, but we do not have time for that. So, I want to spend uh, the next 10 minutes describing how we would control a machine like this. Let us look at typically how the operator would like to interact with the machine and give it commands. So, as an operator what would you like to tell the machine? This is a machine which can walk, which can move its body from one point to another in a environment, right. Now, how do you like to, what is the easiest way you would like to give commands? I would like to simply specify a new location to which it should go, as simple as that, right. If I have a pet dog, I will say go there, right, and I will point. Like that, I should be able to specify a location in the room which it will be able to recognize and it should be able to do the rest. It should be able to walk to that position. Now, that position may be at a higher level, right. So, let me pose that problem. The machine is at some position, the operator is sitting at a console and it is in a room. I should be able to simply say this is the goal and give it to the robot. The robot should be able to go there. At this point of time, the robot may be somewhere here. Fine. Should be able to somehow go there. Now, look at what the robot has to figure out in order to reach there. I showed you the room in which this has to be there. So, there may be some table out here, right. There may be some pipe laid on the ground like this. There may be another table out here. Now, how does the robot figure out the figure out how to reach this place. Wherever the robot is, one essential thing is that it should know where the goal position is. It should also know whether it is at the level at which it is or it is whether it is on a another uh, another level in the vertical direction, right. If it is on the mezzanine floor, then it has to climb some steps to go there. It cannot be a point out in the air, right that is hanging in the air where the robot cannot reach. So, now it has to figure out a route to reach there, that route could be has to avoid this obstacles, has to step over these smaller obstacles, it can be like this, it could be like this, it could be like this, it has to figure out a route. 
right and in figuring out the root it has to actually avoid the obstacles a root is one which is a free road right a free space it can move along so it has to first figure this out and after after figuring this out it has to move along that right so the 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 problem of figuring out this particular route or a path is called path planning right i had briefly described that at some stage i haven't okay and that is called path planning right it is usually tackled as a combinatorial optimization problem using graph search right you can look up the book by latombe in order to have a understanding of that having figured figured out a route let's assume simplify the problem and say that there are no more obstacles and is simply a path from here to this point so start go so what i mean is that the entire path the center of mass of the of the body or the center of the body has to trace while it walks from here to here is decided fine it is actually detrimental to decide it exactly initially because while it is moving here something may come across you may walk across robot may have to stop allow you to pass and then move forward or it may be it may be that in figuring out the route you hadn't used any detailed information and this may turn out to be pretty close to some corner and you may have to take some deviation fine so all this may have to be done but for the moment let's assume that this path is exactly given and your job the machine's job is to make its center of center move through this path okay so while doing it let's also assume that at any point you suppose the robot has only two cameras and it cannot be shifted too much the cameras cannot be reoriented then while it is walking it would like to see the place where it is going to step where it is going to go forward it it would like to see that so at any point of time the robot would like to orient itself in such a way that it is looking ahead correct that is ideal when we walk we don't walk sideways unless we look at that side we would like to see where we are going so this is one way the robot can go but if it has cameras all around this is not a big problem at any point it can have any orientation so while it is moving along this path the orientation itself may be specified in a arbitrary fashion fine so the entire motion of the body except for let's assume that while the body is moving it's it is kept vertical the body is kept vertical it doesn't tilt with respect to gravity there is an advantage to that for our design the advantage is that the swivel actuators don't start feeling too much torque if it get tilted it starts feeling torque and the swivel actuators are not all that powerful cannot apply too much torque so it may not be able to actually sustain that kind of torque which will come on it when the body gets tilted that is why we don't want the body to be tilted so body is kept vertical so then only three parameters define the position of the robot one is this particular angle it makes with some global reference frame theta the other is the position itself of the center of mass of the robot in some global reference frame it is like planar motion right so the planar motion of the body is entirely specified once we specify the path and the orientation of the machine now we may need to make the robot move along that the two gaze which i have i've shown you are gaze which will take it along straight paths without rotating we need to figure out gates which will allow it to move along curved paths as well as rotate itself this particular problem is called gate generation once you generate the gate you get the information about how exactly the foot has to be moved with respect to the body the motion of the feet with respect to the body at the end of gate generation you have that particular calculation particular information 
then what needs to be done is the following. Once you know how the feet has to be moved with respect to the body, it is a problem of tracking which Professor Gandhi described in, in the control course. You need the end effector to move in a particular fashion as a function of time. You need to move the motors in order to move the end effector like that. And if there are disturbances while it moves, you need to correct and still move along as close as possible along the path which is specified. So, it becomes the problem of tracking a given motion of the end of the foot, uh, end of the leg that is the foot with respect to the body of the machine. This actually is a fairly complex mechanism with a lot of non-linearities in order to do this when doing this. But if we do the inverse kinematic calculation which uh, I had described earlier, if you are given the position of the feet in the body coordinate frame at any point of time, you will be able to calculate the length of this actuator at any point of time in order to take it through these various positions and also the angle made by the swivel actuator at any point of time. So, basically you will be and these particular linear actuators although the length is changing what is really happening is that the motor is rotating, rotating a lead screw and the nut is moving along the lead screw in order to change the length of the actuator right. So, the length of the actuator can be linearly uh, is linearly related to the motion of the motor. So, finally, what you need to control is the motion of the motor. So, you basically have the information about how, how the feet have to be moved with respect to the body is converted to how the motors have to be moved as functions of time. This may be some motions like this. And what you need to then do is make the motor move exactly like this. That is the shaft angle change with time in this fashion. And this is done by feedback control using encoders or potentiometers which are measuring the motion of the leg. Right? This is how the final control is. This part of the control is called lower level control. And this part of the control, gauge generation and path planning, are sub problems under what is called higher level control. This division of the total control problem into higher and lower levels or different levels is actually to make the break the problem into sub problems which are easier to solve. If the problem is given as I want to go from here to here now find how to control the motors in order to do that it is actually a very large problem. It is broken up into these segments in order to actually solve each of those sub problems in a simpler fashion. Each of those sub problems turn out to be simpler than the larger problem and it is easier to solve. Okay. So, in almost any robot you will have the higher levels of control where the which the purpose of that is to convert the demands or the commands of the operator to the motions of the motor, the reference motions of the motor. And then the lowest level which takes the reference motions of the motor and tries to achieve that. Right? This is true in a manipulator also. So, the problem of trajectory planning or joint interpolation and all those things come under high level. The problem of the manipulator control using the dynamics and all that which Professor Gandhi described comes under lower level. Lower and higher does not have anything to do with the complexity of the task, fine. It simply has to do with the position in the hierarchy into which the total problem is divided. Okay. So, this to fully describe this particular case study quite a few lectures are required. So, in these two lectures which we had, this gives you a flavor of the total problem and some of the segments of that problem. Okay.